Welcome to uh, the introduction to the theory and practice of regulation and the first class in this course on why regulate. I'm Carl Peckman. I'm the director of the National Regulatory Research Institute. Um, just a little bit about me. I have uh, a long history in regulation. I've been working in, bo in both federal and state issues uh, since the 1970s. My major area, which will probably uh, come through as I go through our slides today, is the economics of electricity. And um, I want to welcome you all. We have over 600 people uh, registered today. Uh, I think many of you are probably new to the field of regulation. And uh, for me, it's been a uh, marvelous career, just really interesting, uh, public spirited. And uh, I hope that the courses that we're providing uh, provide you with a nice entry into, into regulation. And for those of you who are experienced regulators, I hope that the courses that we're providing uh, give you new insights and also um, ideas and, and things of that sort. I want to just briefly uh, explain how this course fits into the overall activities of the National Regulatory Research Institute. Um, this is a uh, part of the regulatory training initiative, what we call the RTI. Our objective with the RTI is to create primarily a remote based platform that will uh, provide a whole series of courses to educate the regulatory community. Uh, these courses will start with the introduction to theory and practice of regulation, which we're starting today. We'll have courses on utility accounting and finance, rate making, performance based regulation, uh, how to uh, think about uh, pricing of uh, distributed energy resources, um, how to be a witness. Uh, there are just a huge number of issues uh, on our agenda. And uh, we look forward to um, sharing not only our knowledge, but the knowledge of many people in the regulatory community who are helping us put together these courses. Um, just very briefly, essentially the RTI has uh, three components. They're all uh, uh, hung together with what we call a learning management system, which we're in the process of, uh, of developing. We're gonna have a resource library. Um, we're gonna have discussion boards, which we hope will uh, morph into or evolve into a, uh, a digital commons, regulatory commons, so people uh, with like and diverse ideas can share them and discuss them um, and uh, share uh, insights into what happened in different proceedings and things of that sort. And then we're gonna have uh, training um, sessions that will be remote and also on demand. Uh, these training sessions will be um, uh, recorded and uh, we will be providing you all with more information as we go along about new training opportunities and how to participate in those opportunities. Uh, just a little bit about uh, NRRI, the National Regulatory Research Institute. We are the uh, Public Utility Commission's uh, Research Institute. We were formed by the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners in 1976. And we essentially provide three services. We provide broad research on topics of interest to the regulatory community and in particular commissions. We provide direct assistance to commissions and we also provide uh, training and education. Just a little bit about today. Um, I'll be making the presentation after which we'll have a Q&A session. Let's turn to the substance of what we have today. Uh, what, what does it mean to regulate? Um, the Oxford English Dictionary uh, defines the term regulate as to control, govern, or direct by rule or, or regulations. A regulation is a, is a rule that prescribed for the management of some matter or for the regulating of conduct 
a governing precept or direction, a standing rule. Um, regulation involves sustained and focused control exercised by a public agency over activities that are valued by a community. Regulation is often seen as a negative, but there are also, or a red light concept, but there are also uh, positives where regulation facilitates um, behavior and the adoption of behavior, all called the green light concept. One example is the uh, implementation of energy efficiency in the electric utility and gas utility industries, and actually in the water industry as well, um, where under normal circumstances, uh, those business models uh, did did not encourage um, conservation and energy and, and efficiency. So why do we regulate? Well, the, the, the simplest answer on its face is to further the public interest. And um, <clears throat> for those of you who've been involved in regulation for a long time, you know that uh, that term public interest really can be defined in a whole variety of different ways. And a lot of it depends on the perspective of, of those people who are providing it. Regulation can prevent or compensate for market failure. What is market failure? Uh, when there are non-priced goods, largely environmental issues, um, <coughs> where uh, externalities are not priced uh, in the market. Another reason for regulation is to avoid monopoly abuse. Uh, the uh, exercise of mo monopoly abuse um, in one form or the other, raising prices and restricting supply. And others to rationalize an industry to the extent that what we have is sometimes called destructive competition in, in, in various industries. Um, regulation also occurs uh, and is sought by entities um, for their own self-interest. Sometimes this is called regulatory capture and it often is uh, sought to create barriers to entry uh, for other entities that can compete with the firm seeking regulation. Regulation assures uh, accurate and adequate information. And also one of the reasons for regulation uh, and the seeking of regulation um, is to provide financial stability because it provides a set of rules within which a corporation can uh, operate. But regulation really uh, spans both social and economic issues. From the standpoint of social issues, there are things like standards, uh, drug quality and efficacy. It's obviously very important. Um, started uh, occurring when many uh, patent medicines were being sold that had no efficacy at all, and uh, in many cases were harmful to the people who were taking them. The corporate average fuel or cafe uh, stand, standard, economy standard, uh, is another example of a, a standard in which uh, fuel, fuel uh, standard, mile per gallon standards are set. Uh, prohibitions, well, uh, we can think of many prohibitions. Uh, one is, for example, on the use of DDT, pesticide, uh, uh, that was uh, brought to light um, in the 60s uh, with very deleterious effect on avian populations. Uh, there are market-based solutions to uh, social issues or environmental issues, for example, uh, permit training programs on uh, for sulfur uh, to mitigate the effects of, of climate change, I'm sorry, of uh, acid rain. And, and by the way, some of these social issues and economic issues kind of merged uh, a bit. So uh, you'll see that there's some redundancy. There's information-based uh, regulation, for example, nutrition labeling, uh, you know, providing information to the population about what's in food, helps them make better nutritional decisions. And then there are externalities and the control of externalities. One example is uh, secondhand smoke. Um, uh, 
Uh, it used to be uh, when I was in college, uh, there was smoking was allowed in in, in bars, and uh, people who were smoking. Um, the definition of an externality is an action that's taken without consideration of the effects on other people. So the people who were smoking cigarettes were not considering the fact that their smoking a cigarette had a negative impact on other people's health. Well, uh, health regulations were imposed to restrict that kind of impact, that kind of externality. Now there's uh, economic regulation, there's price regulation, rate of return, we'll be talking more about price regulation quantity regulation, renewable portfolio standards, for example, that set rules on how much uh, renewable energy uh, needs to uh, be developed in particular states. Entry and exit, very, very important set of standards um, with respect to uh, the development of both the utility industries and also uh, as we look forward into a more uh, renewable um, future where there's a question about who will be the provider or who will own uh, renewable energy. Uh, will it be on the customer premises? Will it be central, centrally owned? Uh, and will it, or will it be utility owned? Um, and then there are market failures or externalities again. Market regulation has a very long history, or regulation in general has a very long history. For example, uh, in the early 1200s, the city of London regulated both the quality and price of goods sold in markets. In Ackroyd's book, London, the Biography, he, he describes the fact that there are many hundreds of regulations back in 1200, controlling every aspect of trading life 20 regulations applied to bakers alone. Every baker was commanded to leave the impression of his seal upon the loaf of bread. It was decreed that fish brought into the city in closed baskets shall be as good at the bottom of the basket as at the top of the basket. So the purpose of, of this early regulation was really to systematize trading uh, so that there was little possibility of one falls measures and adulterated food or bad food or shoddy manufacture of different goods and services. Now, there's a very well-known article uh, called The Tragedy of the Commons, which introduces the concept of the tragedy of the commons by Garrett Hardin. This was his presidential address to the American Association of the Advancement of Science in 1976. And what he described was the way in which the commons can be overused. He started out by saying, picture a pasture open to all, a commons without assigned property rights. It is reasonable that each herdsman will try to keep as many cattle as possible on the shared commons. Each herdsman seeks to maximize his gain asking, what is the benefit to me? The rational course is for each herdsman to add another animal to his herd, and another, and another. Therein is the tragedy. Each man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd without limit in a world that is limited. The herdsman sees a positive benefit of adding an additional uh, animal. The negative cost is that it increases overgrazing. The societal cost is that it increases overgrazing. Well, Parliament recognized the problem of the tragedy of the commons, although they didn't call it that, back in 1773 when they enacted the Enclosure Act, which provided property rights and restricted access to the commons by enclosing it. Well, there are other issues with respect to the commons that have led to regulation. For example, with the Cuyahoga River. By the 1880s, Cleveland was a major industrial town. The mayor of Cleveland at the time described the Cuyahoga River that ran through the center of the city as an open sewer through the center of the city. Since the 1860s, through the fire of 1969, the river 
caught fire 13 times. This is not what you would call a healthy ecosystem. And the reason was that it was, there was unimpeded uh, effluent into the river. There, was no, there were no restrictions on what you could put into the river, when you could put it in and things of that sort. Cleveland Mayor Carl Stokes lobbied for the clean water regulation after the fire at 69, and President Nixon signed the Clean Water Act of 1972, largely motivated by the experience of the Cuyahoga River and the demonstration of the need for regulation by the fire in the Cuyahoga River. Now we have other issues that are facing us in terms of the global commons. The, it's well understood by scientists that the emission of carbon contributes to global warming. And states have responded to this climate, to climate change and to this, this problem. Most states in the United States are implementing uh, policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Many state goals not only include the electric industry, but include heating and transportation fuels as well. 13 states are reducing greenhouse gas emissions at least 80% by no later than 2050. And 13 have goals of 80% or more clean electricity production by no later than 2050. So you have a sense of regulation that there's a common good associated with regulation. But what we're really interested in this course and in the regulatory training initiative is the regulation of utilities. What is a public utility? Public utilities are entities subject to direct government regulation of prices and services. Now, it should be, I want to make it clear that there are multiple types of public utilities. For example, in electricity, we have investor owned utilities that are owned by investors. Um, stockholders in the utility. We have municipal utilities, which are owned by municipalities, such as the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And we have cooperative utilities um, that are probably the most numerous type of utility in the country and often serve uh, small uh, rural areas uh, th throughout the country. But they all have some commonality in that they're subject to some form of rate control and the idea is to protect customers. The other aspect of utility that's important is that they're enterprises that supply continuously or repeated services through physical connections between the supplier and the customer. Um, for electric and historically telephony, that was over wires for water and gas, that's through pipes. Well, what are the dimensions of utility regulation? The first is price regulation. Um, utility regulation has really uh, evolved based on what's called cost of service regulation, and that's changing now. And we'll have courses that describe why that's changing and how that's changing and um, quantity uh, issues. Uh, again, showing my electric side, uh, we often talk about adequate service or resource adequacy, having enough generation uh, or resources to be able to serve uh, the demand of customers reliable, reliably. We have entry and exit regulation. Uh, what are, who, who's able to do what? Um, what entities are allowed to enter into uh, the business and what are the terms under which they're allowed to enter into the business? Quality regulation, safety, for example. Um, uh, we all are probably are aware of, of instances of, of uh, unsafe uh, utilities. Uh, gas explosions happen periodically. Um, we're also, in terms of, of quality, we're concerned about uh, the safety of, of water. Uh, because uh, you know what water utilities provide is potable water for people, and it's very important that it maintain uh, 
certain standards in terms of uh, health. Uh, we also have consumer protection. In these days, we have a lot of concern about um, customers who are uh, unemployed uh, as a consequence of COVID and the utility industry has across the board adopted um, new regulations uh, that uh, forestall shutoffs of customers. There are some critical questions of utility regulation and I'm gonna spend some time giving the background behind those questions which is, what are utilities allowed or obligated to do? That's the first question. And the second question is, how do they charge for those services? Well, when it comes to what utilities are allowed to do, the first and main issue associated with utility is the franchise. It's one of the earliest forms of economic regulation. In my mind, a franchise is a grant of corporate life. It provides market access to an entity. Blackstone's commentaries back in 1766 described the franchise as a royal privilege or branch of the king's prerogative, subsisting in the hands of a subject, being therefore derived from the crown, they must arise from the king's grant. But the same identical franchise that has been granted to one cannot be bestowed upon another, for that would prejudice the former grant. In other words, it controls access. It provides access to the franchise and it controls access. Well, English common law has played a large role uh, in uh, the development of uh, regulatory uh, law in the United States. And the first franchise that was adopted in the United States was in 1816 in Baltimore. And it was for a manufactured gas utility in the city. And this picture de depicts manufacture, a manufacturing facility for manufactured gas. Essentially, the gas was processed at high heat and, I'm uh, sorry, coal was processed at high heat and gas was taken off and was put through pipes uh, for customers. And it was put through pipes for customers for a single purpose, and that purpose was lighting. And so the gas utilities uh, were really there to provide lighting, which is why the Baltimore uh, company was called the Gas Light Company of Baltimore. Well, when the city of Baltimore gave the franchise um, it passed an ordinance which described the conditions of the franchise. And most importantly, in terms of the franchise, is it granted the company the right to lay pipes beneath the streets, squares, lands, and alleys of the city in order to procure better light. Having said that, if a utility put pipes in the streets, they were required to immediately repave those streets. So the disruption, disruption needed to be minimized. Um, there were provisions to protect private property in the franchise law. But I think what's really interesting is that the cost of lighting was not to exceed other forms of illumination. So in effect, the franchise itself regulated price in addition to access. Well, the idea of franchising, franchises limiting market access was, was not lost um, in terms of the politics of granting franchises. Again, the whole issue that we're, we were looking at in the early history of the gas industry and the electric industry was lighting. Um, and, and lighting was very, very precious. Uh, George Washington, uh, who at the time was considered a, a wealthy man and would now still be considered a wealthy man, um, only burned one uh, whale oil candle a night for his reading. Now, why whale oil? Whale oil was uh, provided the best quality light. And so it was a wealthy person's form of lighting were whale 
oil candles. And just think about it. He burned one a night, and that was it. Just think about what we have now. Well, as whales became uh, scarce due to harvesting for lighting purposes, uh, the kerosene industry developed and uh, formed kerosene, technologically formed ker developed kerosene lamps and new forms of lighting. As the manufactured, and we're quite successful, as the manufactured gas industry tried to come into New York City, the uh, kerosene merchants tried to keep the manufactured gas interest from getting franchises. They succeeded. They developed a manufactured gas industry in New York. Um, as you could see from the previous slide, uh, it was really a horrible uh, industrial um, process. Uh, Edison, uh, Thomas Edison, uh, when describing the light from manufactured gas, said it was a nasty yellow light too, and far removed from the color of natural light, with the nausea dim flicker of gas. And Edison uh, decided to pursue the electric light bulb after seeing the manufactured gas business. In fact, he probably did some of the first load studies in the electric industry. I mean, he undoubtedly did some of the first load studies in the electric industry by going around and having investigators count when different gas lights were on and when they were off. And he did that in order to figure out when he could sell electric light and when he couldn't. Well, he first he had to invent what we now think of as a, uh, you know, the incandescent bulb and generation and control and things of that sort. But his primary uh, financier, J.P. Morgan, in addition to all of the technological wonders, required a franchise. And he required a franchise because it provided financial stability in the investment. Well, Edison got the franchise and built the Pearl Street Station and the first electric distribution uh, company in the world in uh, lower Manhattan. I think they had 4,000 lights in the first, uh, was, was, was what they had, 4,000 light bulbs. Um, now, one of the things that's really interesting about what Edison did in New York is that he did it with the assistance of Samuel Insel, who uh, went to work for Edison at the age of 19 as his secretary. Samuel Insel was a financial genius um, who ran into difficulties later in his life, but uh, that's, a, that's a separate story from what we're telling now. Uh, Samuel Insel invented the Edison Electric Company on his first day of working for Edison as a financial way of developing utilities. Just absolutely stunning the effect that he had on the business model of electricity. Why am I telling you this? Because we're going to get back to Samuel Insel in a couple of minutes. So we, we talked about access, franchises, and the importance of access, and why one would want access, why one would want a right to use the city streets, and why one would want that form of regulation. Let's shift to prices now. And the regulation of prices has often uh, been uh, referred to or, or based upon the concept that something is affected with a public interest. Lord Hale, the Chief Justice of England, in 1670 wrote, if the king or subject have a public wharf unto which all persons that come to that port must come as for the purpose of unlaid or laid their goods, because they are not, they are the wharfs only licensed by the queen. In other words, is a wharf, a monopoly. There cannot be undertaken arbitrary and excessive duties or cranage, wharfage, passage, which is a fee for weighing, and so forth, Neither can they, they be enhanced to an immoderate rate, but the duties must be reasonable and moderate. 
For now, the wharf and crane and other convenience are affected with a public interest. So he introduced this notion of affected with a public interest. That notion has become the basis for uh, utility and price regulation in the United States uh, since the uh, Munn versus Illinois case was uh, decided by the Supreme Court in 1876. Munn and his partners owned a third of the grain elevator capacity in the 1860s. Now, if any entity owned a third of any capacity at this point, they would be considered a monopolist uh, given the current uh, rules or economics of evaluating monopoly, but be that as it may, that wasn't the end of it because the grain elevators in Chicago were known to collude on price. Well, in response to the pricing of the grain elevators, which stored grain for shipment, the Illinois legislature passed uh, a law that set a maximum price for storage of grain. Munn ignored the price regulation and challenged the ability of the state to regulate privately owned enterprises. The Supreme Court upheld the ability of states to regulate prices of industry affected with a public interest. So here again, there's this notion of we regulate because something is affected with a public interest. And further, the Supreme Court said, when private property is devoted to a public use, it is subject to public regulation. Well, one of the reasons that we regulate utilities is because they're what we call natural monopolies. John Stuart Mill articulated the concept of a natural monopoly in his principles of of political economy in 1885, when he wrote, how great an economy of labor would be obtained if London were supplied by a single gas or water company instead of the existing plurality. While there are even as many as two, this implies double establishments of all sorts, when one only with a small increase could probably perform the whole operation equally well double sets of machinery and works when the whole of the gas or water required could generally be produced by one set only. So that introduced the concept of the natural monopoly. As economists, we now have uh, more formal definitions. And so a natural monopoly is characterized as a firm that exhibits economies of scale. A firm has economies of scale when it can produce a given good at a lower price or a lower cost than two or more firms. Now, I think it's important to distinguish economies of scale with economies of scope, because I, I believe that as we go forward in time, economies of scope are going to become increasingly uh, an important aspect of why we regulate certain and how we regulate certain entities. Economies of scope occur when one firm can provide a bundle of products for less than two or more firms. So let's take a look at this from an electric perspective. From an electric perspective, the cost of electric generation through the 1970s, early 1970s, declined the larger the generator. So the generators had economies of scale. Um, so one firm owning a generator, a larger generator, the larger the generator, was able to provide service at, you know, at a lower cost than two firms with smaller generators. Now, economies of scope is somewhat different. If we look at the organized markets and the control that we now have with independent system operators, uh, given the transition in the electric industry, over the years, we don't sell electricity in a bundled way anymore, but we've broken up the product of electricity into many different products, into energy products, into capacity products, 
into what are called ancillary service products that help maintain the frequency on the system and things of that sort. So it's a bundle of products that are being sold. And the market for those products is the independent system operators. I would argue that the independent system operator has economies of scope because it's more efficient to have one independent system operator for a given area than more than one independent system operator. The duplication of cost is uh, unwarranted. And the cost actually for creating control centers for independent system operators is, is, is very large. Um, so how do we really implement this notion of economies of scale? And um, again, I'm gonna shift to the electric industry and I'm gonna uh, bring up Intel again um, because Intel understood generation um, quite well. Uh, um, he ran the, the, uh, the production arm for Edison of building generators until uh, uh, Edison uh, uh, lost his control of his, uh, of, of his business over the, uh, the um, ACDC wars, the, you know, whether or not the, the electric system should be uh, direct current or alternating current. But, and when, when that occurred, Insel went to become president of uh, Commonwealth Edison in Chicago where he really developed the idea of what he, an electric utility was. And he did it based upon, largely based upon economies of scale. But he had another observation, which was that load diversity, the fact that customers use electricity at different times, contributes to the economies of scale. And it does so by reducing the cost of providing service to customers. If each customer had to build a generator for their own service, um, they uh, would have to build much more generation than if they were aggregated uh, together in a utility. So by aggregating customers together, he took advantage of uh, load diversity and he was able to build load by discouraging customers from having their own generation, and he was able to pursue economies of scale. Well, Intel uh, saw competition as a real problem to his achieving economies of scale. And he was the president in 1898 of the National Electric Light Association, which uh, ultimately morphed into the Edison Electric Institute. And in his presidential address in 1898, he called for regulation. And he stated, in order to protect the public, exclusive franchises should be, in other words, excluding competition, should be coupled with the conditions of public control requiring all charges for service fixed by public bodies to be based on cost plus a reasonable profit. Costs will be reduced in direct proportion to the protection afforded by the industry. He later argued another advantage of public utility commissions was if laws are properly drawn, competition is prevented. So unlike the, uh, the kerosene merchants, who were trying to restrict access to the market for their own betterment, Insel was one interested in, his, in the betterment of his firm, but he also recognized in order to achieve that, he had to give something up. And what he gave up was uh, rate regulation and the ability to charge uh, prices without regulation. Well, customer protection also became a basis for utility regulation. Uh, the New York City Charter required annual bidding for lighting contracts. By 1900, the Consolidated Gas Company had become a monopoly and gave a single bid. And they refused to negotiate. The uh, state uh, initiated um, a... Uh, an investigation into utility pricing, electric and gas pricing in New York. 
Charles Evans Hughes, a distinguished New York City uh, attorney, led the investigation, which found um, that the utilities overcharged the public, were guilty of rate discrimination, uh, and provided unsafe and unreliable service. And what they proposed was an independent regulatory agency with power to investigate the quality of service provided by the utilities and the reasonableness of their rates. Largely based upon the findings of this study and this study, Hughes became the governor of New York, defeating William Randolph Hearst in 1906. In 1907, Governor Hughes created the New York Public Service Commission and also in 1907, Wisconsin introduced regulation and created the New York Public Service Commission also to protect customers. So you can see that there are two, there's a convergence of regulation here, um, of the interest in regulation, both from the standpoint of the industry and the standpoint of customer protection. So one question that we have, that we often get as regulators is, is competition, so, so here we have a rationale for, for why we regulate utilities, but one of the questions that we, we often hear is, as regulators, is competition a substitute for regulation? And indeed, there have been uh, industries that have been subject to rate regulation, trucking and the fuel price of natural gas, that in fact were not uh, natural monopolies and uh, for which those markets have subsequently been deregulated. Uh, in electricity, um, we've unbundled the various segments in the electric industry from uh, generation, transmission, and distribution. And now we see generation as being able to survive largely as a competitive uh, activity, whereas we still look at electric distribution as being uh, requiring regulation because it remains a natural monopoly. So there are still open questions on why regulate. The first one is, when is competition legitimate alternative to regulation? And then other questions are, do economies of scope provide the rationale for regulated utility or for regulation? <clears throat> There's a, a question about what happens if we go down the path of regulation or of competition and it doesn't work? Can we go backwards? Can we re re-regulate an industry and how and why do we do that? And then the question is, uh, another question is, what is the role of the economic or utility regulator in achieving environmental objectives? Many of these are questions that we'll be looking at through the remainder of this course. The course is an exciting course. We um, have some great speakers and we're covering a lot of who have been involved in regulation for a long time. I hope that you find this and the other courses uh, of interest and uh, things that help contribute to the way in which you think about uh, the regulatory issues in front of you. Please use the Q&A um, protocol to submit questions and, and thank you very much. Uh, Sherry, how are we doing there? Thank you, Carl. That was fascinating to me with my background not being in electricity. We have a number of questions, so let me start with the first one, which talks about monopolies. Lots of industries have economies of scale, but are not considered to be monopolies. Is it a question of degree of the economies of sale, or are there other factors that define a natural monopoly? Well, I would, I would think that if an industry has, uh, is a natural monopoly, then um, it would become a monopoly in that industry. And so therefore, it would, you would either be subject to regulation or uh, antitrust. Um, antitrust rules. Uh, 
Thank you. And, and the questions are beginning to come in fairly rapidly. Has the public interest been further defined in any state or federal law in the U.S.? That's a good question. I, I, I don't, I don't uh, know of any place where the public interest is defined in a single place. I know that it's defined um, in many different ways. Uh, sometimes it's defined from an entirely environmental standpoint. Um, when I was working at DOE, one of the considerations that DOE was involved in was uh, uh, import licenses um, for uh, importing energy, uh, transboundary en energy, and the standard there was a public interest standard. And there was some debate internally about what what exactly that meant. And was it strictly an economic standard or did it include environmental issues as well? So there isn't a, there isn't a given a single uh, definition of a public interest standard that I know of. Um, I, I will, if, if anybody else knows of a single definition, please let us know and we'll, we'll post it uh, along with the slides, which will be posted on the NRI website uh, afterwards. We'll, we'll, we're going to go back through and provide some citations in the slides, uh, which are cumbersome when you're making a presentation. So, Carl, how are utilities incentivized to promote energy efficiency? How does regulation do that? Well, we're going to we're going to have a course on that, uh, but let me just say that there there are really there's a problem in terms of the traditional utility model um, uh, providing incentives for the uh, for utility to um, uh, promote energy efficiency and. Uh, we won't go into what those issues are, but let me give you the response. So the response was that one, it's often called the three-legged stool, and hopefully I'll remember all three legs. The first leg is that the utility uh, loses revenues. So one wants to compensate the utility for the loss of revenues uh, that they have from energy efficiency. The second is that the utility incurs costs associated with uh, energy efficiency programs. And so the utility needs to be made whole with respect to those costs. And for some quirky issues with respect to regulation, sometimes if you don't have what are called cost trackers and a utility makes an investment in something uh, in between rate cases, there's not a, a vehicle for recovery. So We've created vehicles for recovery. And the third way is to, leg of the stool, is to provide direct incentives. Um, the value of savings to customers is, let's say, 100 million. Well, you have the utilities uh, take a share of that, uh, either uh, as a proportion or as uh, a bump up on their uh, rate of return. Okay. Um, besides Munn versus Illinois, are there other landmark Supreme Court cases that have shaped the regulatory la landscape? The entire regulatory landscape has been shaped by Supreme Court cases. And as we go through uh, the different aspects of, uh, of um, regulation, we'll be talking about those Supreme Court cases. But just even in terms of the uh, way in which rates are created, um, almost every component of rates has been subject to some form of uh, Supreme Court case. And, there, and, and by the way, the Supreme Court cases are still shaping the future of regulation. So there have been some very important Supreme Court cases uh, lately. Um, uh, FERC v. EPSA, for example, um, allowed the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or enabled the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to determine the price for what's called demand response, paying customers to uh, not consume power um, 
and, and that's a, a mechanism for bringing customers into the operation of the electric system. And we'll be talking more about that as we go into different different courses along the way. But yes, the Supreme Court has a vital role. And we have a, a question about competition. Um, is the degree to which competition may be a substitute for regulation different for different types of regulation? That is, is competition a better surrogate for controlling price than, for instance, ensuring consumer safety well, or vice versa? Uh, that, that's a really good question. And I think part of it is, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that regulation does and one of the reasons for regulation is, is to reduce transactions costs. So um, you, you, you might have uh, uh, hazards that are provided uh, by products in the market and individuals would be able to sue uh, and um, litigate over that. And that's a form of, that could be considered a form of, of competition. But I think really the structure of each market uh, of each good affects whether or not um, competition is, is, is effective. And by the way, competition is itself a regulatory force but a little bit different. Um, so I, I hope I answered that question. And then we have another question about monopolies and, and how is the industry approaching rooftop solar if that product drives on creating economies of scale and wants the customer to be part of the industry's monopoly? Well, I th there, th there are many, many ways in which rooftop solar is being uh, incorporated into the electric systems. Uh, one of the ways in which it's being incorporated is called net energy metering, in which uh, essentially the customer's retail meter is run backwards. In some states, the utilities are allowed to invest in, in solar facilities. The question of economies of scale is very interesting, and there's a there, there have been articles uh, that have challenged whether or not solar plus storage um, will significantly alter the utility model uh, because uh, it threatens sort of the economies of scale of, of the electric system. Now, I, for one, don't think that's necessarily correct. I think that many people uh, don't want to have their own uh, solar facilities um, or want to participate in a larger solar, uh, you know, municipally owned solar or, uh, but so um, there's, it's really hard to see economies of scale, in, in my mind, in rooftop solar, there may be economies of scale in terms of producing the solar panels that will drive down the cost. And so the economies of scale might occur at a different part of the supply chain with respect to solar. So, um, but it's a, it's a very good, good question. The, the issue of of the regulatory treatment of, of solar and of storage is something that's going to be unfolding. And when I talk about exciting issues uh, that will affect the future and will affect the environment in the future, that's certainly one of them. And finally, do you have any recommendations for reading for people interested in further introductory study of why we regulate? Um, yes, I do. And uh, we'll put up a, um, a bibliography uh, on the website uh, under this class. So, um, I, I think that's the best way to, to, to go about it. 
um, as opposed to starting to rattle off. I mean, a lot of the books on, on um, are, are fairly, uh, some of the best books are fairly old and probably more difficult to find, uh, um, you know, from the 50s or even the 30s or earlier. So we'll, we'll see what we can do. One of the things that I hope to do is to get permission to digitize some of those books and to put them on the website. Fantastic. Um, are there any other questions out there? We are drawing close to the end. So, uh, Carl, let me turn it back to you. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all uh, for attending today um, and uh, remind you all that Professor William Boyd is giving the next presentation next Thursday. Uh, with a class entitled Public Utility and Just and Reasonable Rates. And um, he's a fantastic uh, um, a lecturer and uh, it's, it's really uh, a fundamental issue with respect to the regulation of utilities and one that's not uh, as well known as uh, well studied as uh, as it could be. So um, we're really fortunate to have Professor Boyd giving the next talk. And with that, I'd like to thank you all and um, please uh, stay safe out there. These are crazy days. And um, we look forward to seeing you next week and uh, the weeks that follow for the rest of the course. Thank you.